Today's episode is part two of our conversation with Harvard Law School professor Ronald Sullivan, best known for reportedly exonerating more wrongfully convicted people than anyone else in history. If you haven't listened to part one yet, you might want to catch that episode first. It should be in your podcast feed right next to this one. In part two, we're continuing the conversation about criminal justice and the role of defense attorneys. We'll also get some career advice for future lawyers from Professor Sullivan, especially those of you who want to do some good in the world. Just like last time, we're touching on some difficult topics in this conversation, including mentions of sexual assault, police brutality, and murder. Though there's nothing graphic, you may want to listen with headphones if there are young children around. And with that, let's get back to Professor Sullivan. So you talked about the federal government disassociating itself from the private prison system and that has a salutary effect. Couldn't Congress just pass a law to make it so that you can't make money putting people in prison anymore? Or would there be some kind of constitutional violation, do you think, going on with something like that? Um, interesting. I certainly hadn't heard of that. I'm, I am uh, I'm positive. I can't think of it now, but I, I know there would be some sort of constitutional objection to, uh, I don't know, let, 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 let me not say that. It, it, it's interesting. I, I, I will have to take that under consideration. I, I don't know what the objection would be as I sit here today. I, I, I guess the, the, the Congress could pass a law that says that private enterprises can't do prisons. You threw me off a little bit by the way it was phrased that you can't make money off of it. And I think that would raise objections if it was a institution that existed in the in the private sphere and you say, Well, you can do this privately, but you can't make money on it, you know, maybe. But it it could say that, you know, you we could think of prisons as as, as public institutions and it, you know the private institutions didn't did not always exist and and certainly state legislatures and and congress in the federal space could pass a law that that, that says that prisons are the province of the government uh, you can certainly do that and, and that you know that takes the profit motive uh, out of the out of the private uh, space so uh, but I, I'd, I'd have to think a little little more about how that would work on the ground well do you think that should happen do you think that private prison should not exist anymore? I think that private prison should not exist anymore. Yes, and and the easiest way to do that is for legislatures to recapture that space uh, for the state, uh, and, and and that's easy. So yes, I think that private prisons seem to be a, I mean, just a bad idea. They're a bad idea when they first became popular and and we see they're even worse idea in practice. I mean I mean as you know these uh a lot of these private prisons uh, drive the economy of of entire towns and counties and 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 and, and that's just a, a blatant conflict of interest in in my view. So uh so yeah so that's that's an easy question I think yeah private prison should be a vestige of history. Yeah, absolutely. And here in here in California, we had the uh, much vaunted decision to, quote, ban private prisons last fall. Of course, when you actually read the law, it doesn't ban private prisons at all. It has right, right. enormous carve outs. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, w w welcome to our legal regime. That's, I'm, I'm sorry to laugh, but yes, absolutely. Okay, we're banning all private prisons except for private prisons that do right. anything that private prisons do. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, G gotta love it, right? Right, right. It's you know always, always the window dressing, and you know maybe, maybe speaking of window dressing, or I don't know how you you feel about this. There was a uh, a executive order released today. Oddly, kind of the day after the Supreme Court declined to revisit qualified immunity for law enforcement officers, uh, now we have this executive order from President Trump that talks about certifying police officers in de-escalation, creating a tracking database for officers accused of using ex excessive force, 
trying to prevent them from just being transferred to another department and launching a co-respondent program that would see mental health professionals working more closely with police. You know, is this a step in the right direction or are we talking about, again, more of this kind of similar to that bill to ban private prisons? Let's let's, you know, say some things to shut the people up and then go on with business as usual. So, look, I'm I'm of I'm of mixed minds uh, here. Is it a step in the right direction? Yes, in the sense that it's certainly better than the prior regime. Uh, that's one. Two. Some of these sorts of programs work, right? The um, there's a very famous uh, program in a jurisdiction that escapes me now where they for years have done these partnerships, police and social workers uh, ride together. And they've done a wonderful job uh, over the years of de-escalating situations because every situation doesn't require police intervention. Uh, To the contrary, they oftentimes, uh, you know, mental health issues or any number of things. But when you bring police into it, police are trained in a certain sort of way, and it's just a, 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 a just a not a great mix. So you know, I'm I'm really moved by the sorts of of, of programs that try to wrench situations from a criminal grasp and 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 put them in some other field, whether it's uh you know to divert. I guess is a better way to say it from from the criminal process to some other area. You know, training is good, but training is only as good as the training programs. And and you know this. It's so so. It, it's a question of you know, are are jurisdictions checking a box, or are they engaged in substantive change that 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 really makes a, a difference? My personal so so yes it's it's a step in the right direction in the sense that it's better than before my personal view is that we are at a moment in in history where we can insist on more radical change and by radical change i, I mean i mean real substantive from the ground up sort of change and these opportunities don't come too often politics often works and often works for good reasons in a democracy incrementally. That is, you know, incrementalism is the vocabulary that keeps democratic institutions uh, stable. But in in various times during the, the histories of this republic and in, in the history of the idea of, of republic, there are these radical shifts in order to keep the institution honest. And we're at a point now where I, I, I think that we uh, certainly can have radical shifts. Perhaps we can even reimagine this, this first call. So it is, um, you know, it's not, uh, the, the first call is, is not to the police who has a social worker ride along, right? But we can imagine different institutions that might even respond to certain sorts or categories of, of, of calls that aren't criminal in, in nature. I mean, as you know, the sort of policing function is, is ubiquitous. There's some general trouble, you know, you call the, the police. And, you know, and then the police, again, are trained in a certain sort of way. You know, police arrest, you know, surgeons cut, you know, litigators argue. I mean, we're, we're, we're just trained in a certain tradition. And what I'm attempting to suggest is is that we're at a moment in history where we can start some new traditions here. And the, and the marvelous young people who are out protesting uh, are making it ripe for there to be more radical change in at least this particular institution. And so I, so I certainly hope that the activists and the, the scholars and the policy people will work in tandem to be thoughtful about ways in which we can make some fundamental change. Uh, as for the executive order itself, it's fine on its its, its own terms. Uh, you know, the government the president is attempting to, I think, uh, you know, appease all sides. And, you know, when you do that, you, you aren't doing too much. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know the extent that, you know, it's going to make it, it's the sort of uh, change that is needed at this point in time. So 
I'd like to circle back around because our listeners are mostly aspiring law students and ultimately aspiring lawyers. Uh, I'd like to circle back around to your history of representation and specifically how those two worlds, your representation and then your tenure at Harvard as a as a law professor intersected. So you represented Harvey Weinstein, which most of our listeners know is a movie producer who was accused by many women of sexual assault and rape. And a lot of the students at Harvard Law School reacted very negatively to your representation of Mr. Weinstein, and they called for you to be fired. Ultimately, my understanding is that HLS succumbed, at least in part, to that pressure and declined to renew your status as faculty dean of Winthrop House. This is, if you have a negative view of things like this, this is what's called cancel culture. And so I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that experience and what you feel like could have or should have been done differently, whether that's on the part of the administration, on your part, or on the part of the students? So, so sure. So first, just, just, just factually, you've conflated some, some institutions uh, here. So I want to just clear that up. My uh, faculty dean appointment was at Harvard College that, that was dean of an undergraduate college at, at, at Harvard, the undergraduate institution. And it was the undergraduates who objected. The uh, Harvard Law School was uh, 110% supportive of the representation, you know, 120% uh, supportive. So I got no pushback from the, uh, from the law school or from its ad- administration. Our, our, our wonderful dean and the executive uh, uh, leadership at, at the law school was was nothing but supportive from from day one. So so uh, I am happy to say that people studying law and people who understand the value of the Sixth Amendment were plenty at, at the law school. So 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 you have to separate those two. This was uh, over in the undergraduate space at, at at Harvard College, and you know the the young people that protested there, right? I mean, you know, that's what students should protest. I'm, I'm a big fan of student protests. Uh, you know, they, th- that's the way in which students have their voices heard. In this instance, I think they were terribly mi- misinformed, but I certainly don't blame the students. I mean, I mean, I blame the, the, the dean of the college, the dean of the faculty of arts and sciences, uh, and, and, and the president of, of the institution. They were all uh, hypocrites and, and cowards, uh, sort of in a craven effort to listen to the loudest voice in, in the room. And surprisingly, ignorant and ahistorical and uninformed as to our constitutional tradition in, in the United States. It could have been a wonderful teaching moment for the undergraduate students, uh, but instead they, they reacted in the most craven manner possible and did not renew the deanship, which was, again, different from my law school appointment and was was only at the college. So, and I wasn't teaching at the college anyway. If I were teaching at the college, it would not have interrupted that appointment either, I don't think, uh, because of issues of academic freedom. So, so the short of it is, I, I, I really think, one, the, the undergraduate students certainly could have learned something from the, the, the law students, but more importantly, the, the administration at Harvard College uh, certainly should have been more thoughtful and adult about the situation and used it as a teaching moment. We could have had wonderful conversations about the Sixth Amendment and, 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 and what it means about how everyone has a right to an attorney and about how representation of the uh, unpopular is a cornerstone of our law and what it means to be a, a lawyer. So, you know, this situation, it's one of my proudest, proudest moments. Uh, you know, if I, you know, lose a, a deanship, so what? Happy to do it for this principle. And I do it again and I do it again and I do it again, because if I, as a Harvard law professor, can't stand up for a basic 
constitutional right at a place like, you know, Harvard, no less than, than nobody can. I mean, no lawyer will feel comfortable uh, doing that. So it, look, it, it, it happened. It's unfortunate. There were, I mean, just huge racial overtones there too. I'm, I happen to be uh, African American and the dean of Harvard College reacted uh, in a way toward me very different than any other dean, I think, in the history of the of, of, of the institution, you know, any dean in the history of the institution. And, you know, this was pre-George Floyd, so, you know, it was uh, more palatable to beat up on, on Black people back then than it, than, it is, than it is now. But it really could have been a good learning experience. But, you know, un- unfortunately, it was, it, it was not. And the undergrads really missed a, a valuable potential lesson there. You know, may, and maybe we can kind of have a little bit of that teachable moment here, because I think, you know, any, any reasonable thinking person has to support the Sixth Amendment, right? Everybody should have, if they're going to be dragged in front of a judge and potentially face losing their essential human rights, they should have the right to be represented by someone with expertise, someone who will be zealous in advocating for them. All of those foundational principles are, you know, really on a basic moral level, if you take them in a vacuum, inarguable. But then you go ahead and you put those principles into the system that we have today, where we have a massive wealth gap, where we have racial and gender inequities that go back hundreds of years, and where we have a public defender system that is woefully, woefully underfunded. And I think, you know, some people tend to rankle at the result of the Sixth Amendment in practice today, which is that for the wealthy, there is a there is a different level of access to representation. You talked about selective prosecution and selective arrest, especially in, in regard to drugs. And, you know, as someone living in LA, oh God, yes, you know, cocaine is legal if you're a Hollywood agent. It's absolutely legal if you're a Hollywood agent. <laughs> It's not legal if you're if you're a black or brown youth in the inner city. So, you know, there's 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 these massive inequities and people tend to rankle at wealthy defendants like Weinstein having access to a a different sort of representation than a public defender who maybe gets two hours to go over a case before walking into a trial. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So, look, I think my view on at least this last aspect, and I understand that people certainly worry about the, the, the resource differential between wealthy clients and, and other clients. M- my view has been that, and still is, is that defense attorneys ought to be concerned with anybody on the other side of the V, whether you're wealthy or you know, not, not wealthy. When you're on the other side of the V, you are often reviled and you're you're treated poorly by the system and the you know I spent uh the beginning of my career and the super majority of my time now outside of teaching and 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 writing dealing with with poor populations and people who cannot afford a lawyer and you know one of my mottos is that I provide better representation than than money can buy so for people with no money they get the exact same representation that uh, I gave to Mr. Weinstein or or Aaron Hernandez or anyone else that I've represented who who have resources. One thing that is important to know with respect to resourced clients and in these sorts of clients where the spotlight is on the system nationally, lots of press coverage and 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 and, and so forth. This certainly can have downwind effects on the criminal justice system generally, right? I mean, you get, I mean, these are the sorts of cases that fortunately or unfortunately make law, right? And, and, and you can't just as, you know, the case of a, of a, you know, unnamed person in the inner city of some, some jurisdiction, you can't let the government run roughshod over the constitution. Because if you let that happen and say that, hey, this guy shouldn't receive the process that is 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 due, then you know, what do you think is going to happen to the black or brown client once a sort of precedent is set? Then they're not going to receive the process that's due. 
One of the jobs of the defense attorney is to keep the government honest, is to ensure that the Sixth Amendment rights are respected and, and, and followed. And, and, and that's one of the things that you have to do as a, um, as a criminal defense lawyer. And for all of those people who are listening and, and if any of you are interested in the criminal law, one of the things that you, you have to remember is that the application of the law impacts a lot more people than the, the client right in, in front of you. And if you mess up the sort of structural divide between you know lawyer, defense lawyer, prosecutor, judge, and you start judging which client should receive good representation, then you've done a huge disservice to the system generally. Let, let me put it like this. Uh, so you have... Um, uh, I think uh, Ernesto Miranda, you know, a lot of people say he wasn't a, a, a great guy. You know, he was, uh, you know, he stuck people up all the time, you know, knives and, and so forth in terms of committing robberies. But it's because, and yeah, let's just, let's just assume that he's, he was not a nice, nice guy, but because of lawyers and good lawyers took on his case, we now have the Miranda warnings that set up certain prophylactics that protect individuals from police uh, questioning. Del Rey Map was uh, a ultimately convicted on pornography charges. I mean, you know, it, it may not be the person that you want to have over for, for, for dinner, but because lawyers took on that case, that unpopular case, that unpopular client, that we now have the MAP uh, rule, which is a rule that says that fruits of illegal uh, searches and seizures have to get suppressed. And, and, and that's the sort of thing that protects people from police uh, overreach. And you can go on and on and on. But, you know, these, these cases make, make law and the extent to which you don't protect the rights of everybody in front of the, the the court, then it can it can have implications to 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 other folks. So when it's the United States of America versus one person, or the state of thus and so versus one person, my particular much of my particular professional life has been in the representation of those on the other side of the V. And I think it's you know it's 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 dangerous if you start saying that well some folks should get representations and, and some folks don't so it, 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 it's not going to end well and it won't and it won't end well for poor and black and brown folks uh if, if that's the position let's take a quick break and then we'll be back with more of our conversation with professor ronald sullivan and now a word from our sponsor in light of recent events we understand that we need to work even harder to level the legal education playing field and make the power of advocacy available to those fighting for justice and equality TestMax is proud to announce our commitment to sponsor 1,000 future lawyers over the course of the next five years through our comprehensive Justice in Action program that will help the next generation of lawyers from underrepresented populations as they pursue legal careers. This is a start-to-finish program which will help future lawyers throughout their educational careers and beyond. Resources include LSAT prep and tutoring with LSAT Max, admissions consulting services, first year resources with 1L, job search assistance, and bar review and tutoring with Bar Max. We will also develop a community of these 1,000 Test Max advocates so that their strength can be networked and multiplied. To learn more about this program or to apply, check out the link in the show notes and please keep an eye out for a follow up announcement with full details over the next couple of weeks. And we're back. So in the time we have left, I think I'd really like to pick your brain to give our listeners steps to move forward, because I think a lot of people in the light of the killing of George Floyd and the protests are rethinking what they are going to be doing with their lives. And so I think a lot of people who are, you know, possibly not considering a legal career at all or considering a different manner of legal career 
are now wondering how they can work on civil rights, how they can work on police brutality issues as lawyers. So what would your advice be to people maybe who haven't even made it to law school yet, who are thinking about that? What kind of path should they take forward? Wow. Well, I, I will always invite people to the, uh, to the profession because I, I think lawyers certainly have a unique skill set where you can marry theory and practice. You learn a lot. You can go out and do things. You can get your hands dirty. You can go out and help people who are in distress. So if you're thinking about law, my advice is to study really, really hard. Do the best that you can do in school. Learn as much as you can once you get to law school, and then you you will be able to use these these skills in the service of your fellows. And uh, and to me, that's one of the greatest gifts uh, of all. I mean, I love 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 teaching. I love love writing, but I absolutely love when someone I've represented walks out of prison in, in the wrongful conviction context. I still, there's just no other, there's no greater uh, feeling than seeing a, another human being come out of shackles and, and walk out of that prison door and say, you know, I just want to, I just want to walk on the sidewalk with no one telling me where to go. And, and, and that being just the greatest thing that they've experienced in 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I, I, I can't give adequate vocabulary to the sort that, that sort of feeling. And lawyers can do these things in big ways, small ways, uh, every day. So it's certainly, you know, lawyers get a bad rap in a lot of ways, and there are a lot of lawyer jokes and so forth. Some of them are deserved, I'm sure. But it's a, it, it is a noble profession, and lawyers have paved the way for so much good in this country and 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 hopefully uh, many uh, energetic bright young folk will consider uh, joining the ranks and 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 working to make this uh, make this country and make this world just a little better than than, 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 than it is uh, and you have enough people doing that the, the aggregate effect will be and can be significant so I'm I'm going to be be very selfish right now and and use the fact that we have someone with your expertise on the podcast to kind of ask one of my own questions which hopefully is is some of our listeners question as well. I took the LSAT, I considered law school and I didn't end up going at least so far my LSAT's good for a couple more years. And the thing that stopped me, you know, I went on campus visits and all of that. I even wrote a personal statement and got a couple letters of recommendation, but I never sent away an application. And the biggest thing that stood in my way is there doesn't seem to be a middle path between totally, totally soulless, you know, corporate law and not being able to pay your rent in, in any major city in America. So what's what's the what's somebody to do if they want to use the law for good but they also maybe would like to have a family and have some stability in their life yeah uh so i i actually think that there is this this um this this middle path as you as 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 you put it i, I don't think the choices are as binary i think it just means that you have to uh you may have to look a little harder in terms of the positions that uh, are, are available, so you, you know, you know, depending on what law school you you, you go to, it can be just really easy to get a a, a, a big law firm job. I mean, you, you don't have to you don't have to lift a finger, uh, but to get other things, you have to you have to work at it a, a, a little bit and be creative and and as I said earlier, beat the streets uh, a, a little bit. It's certainly doable. And, you know, and, um, and even public service jobs will uh, allow you, uh, um, most of them will allow you to pay rent and have a family and, and that sort of thing. I mean, I know plenty of people, say, in New York, who uh, there's some really great public service entity, uh, uh, legal services, for example, or the prosecutor's offices or the defense offices that pay a a livable uh, wage, even in a place like New York, and uh, uh, and also do some 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 wonderful work. But you know, you know, if if you still have a, a lingering uh, interest, uh, 
personally. Uh, you, you've, you've got my permission to write me. Uh, just send me an email, and we, we could we could talk more about it uh, offline. I think you'll be surprised with the career choices available to people with a law degree, and that training is really, really uh, helpful, whatever you decide to do with the degree. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have on the table. I've got two more years. I took the June, June 2017 LSAT. So I've got, I've got two more years to decide if I'm using it. <laughs> you, you've got, you, you've got a, you've got a long time and, you know, and, and right. And law, law is not for everyone. I mean, you, you know, you, 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 there's a, it's a big world out there. You, and people do a lot of different things. Uh, so, uh, but if law is for you, I can guarantee there's a, a vocational, space for you out there. It's good to hear someone you know, being encouraging about this profession. I feel like when I talk to our students who are in the year where they're looking at applying, one of the things that you know, they, they all come to us and go, oh my God, I told people I want to be a lawyer and every lawyer in my extended family told me don't do it. So <laughs> I, I, I hear a lot of that. And that's because people do stuff that they don't like doing. You know, if you don't like big law firms, why are you applying to big law firms? Oh, everybody else applies to big law firms. Or on the contrary, if you like, you say, mergers and acquisitions, if that's your thing, if that sort of makes your heart palpitate, you know, go do it. I mean, go, go find and do the things that make you happy. If you do that, uh, you're going to have a satisfying career. Uh, I mean, the data show that a lot of lawyers are unhappy and they're unhappy because they're doing work that they don't enjoy. And I, I think there's a simple answer for that. You know, find the sort of work you you, you enjoy. You know, I get out of bed every morning and I'm excited to go teach. Love it. I mean, I love it. I feel refreshed and and, and rejuvenated after each class. I absolutely love it. Uh, I love trials. I mean, I love it. I just, I love it. It's, you know, just great euphoric type feeling, adrenaline pumping. If I were in other areas of the law, I don't think I'd feel that way. I mean, that's the feeling you want to have. If there are no areas in the law that, that make you feel this way, then do something else uh, altogether. But yeah, a lot of lawyers are unhappy because they're doing the sort of work that they don't that they don't enjoy. Uh, so there's an easy answer, that easy remedy to that. Well, I think that kind of enthusiasm is the best note to go out on. So let me just ask you, Professor Sullivan, do you have anything else, a final thought that you'd like to give our listeners, knowing that they are mostly aspiring law students and lawyers? Sure. So for the aspiring law students and, and lawyers, uh, know that you can make dramatic change in the world. You're getting a skill set that will afford you that ability. And I hope and pray that you use it for that purpose. Amen to that. Well, thank you so much for, for taking so much of your time in a particularly historic moment to, to speak with us. We appreciate this and appreciate you so much for being here today and, and best of luck with all of your work, particularly your, your work to transform the justice system and, and get wrongfully convicted people out of prison. You've done more of that than apparently anybody else in history and, and continuing. And congratulations as well on your, uh, your son's recent choice to attend Harvard. So oh, thank you. Wow. How did you know about that? That's cool. <laughs> I, uh, I saw it. I saw it on your Twitter. So we're, we're, uh, uh, can we <laughs> expect, uh, we expect equally great things from him. So he's got big shoes to fill. He is so much uh, more advanced than I was at his age uh, now. So that uh, it, uh, he, he he doesn't have big shoes to fill. I'm, I'm going to people will look at me and say, hey, are you uh, aren't you Trey Sullivan's father? <laughs> and that's the way it should be. May it be so. May it be so. Indeed. Thank, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And that's our show for today. Thanks for listening, and don't forget your homework. Do a little bit of justice in Professor Sullivan's words. You can find all of our past episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can also send us a question at podcast at testmaxprep.com or record a short voice message at 310-893-6303. You can also check out the show notes for links to further reading and resources from today's episode. Also in the show notes... Check out a link to purchase TestMax's brand new book, 
on error and reasoning questions on the LSAT. 33 Common LSAT Flaws is Test Max's first LSAT Flaws book, and in fact, the first book of its kind. We'll be back with our next episode to discuss flaws and error and reasoning questions in detail. We'll talk more about the book there, but if you'd like to get started with some advanced reading, check the show notes for a link to purchase this brand new book, either in paperback or Kindle formats. Until next time, stay hydrated, study hard, and remember... Plenty Plenty of of heroes heroes carry a briefcase. briefcase.